Hello, hello, and welcome to the Living Earth Collaborative Presents Adventures in Biodiversity Research. I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Dr. Maris Bren White, who is a research fellow with the Institute for Conservation Medicine at the St. Louis Zoo. Before coming to St. Louis, Dr. Bren White has walked a varied and interesting path, the trajectory of which began while completing her bachelor's in international human health at Stanford University in California. After this, Merrick, Maris worked for the University of California, San Francisco, where she studied novel prevention methods for HIV and other sexually transmitted infections in Sub-Saharan Africa. After learning about the fields of conservation medicine and One Health, Maris went back to school to complete a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine and a Master's of Preventative Veterinary Medicine, both at the University of California, Davis. For her MVPM, or her Master's of Preventative Veterinary Medicine, she studied canine distemper in hunting dogs in indigenous communities in Nicaragua's Bosoas Biosphere Reserve. Before joining the Institute for Conservation Medicine here in St. Louis, Maris has worked as a research associate for the Wildlife Health Center at UC Davis and as a contract wildlife veterinarian for the United States Geological Survey. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Maris Brenwhite as she tells us a few of her tales of a conservation veterinarian tracking pathogens and their hosts in Madagascar, South Africa, and more. All right, thank you, Sasha, for that introduction. And thank you to the LEC for inviting me to speak as a part of the Adventures in Biodiversity research series. Um, and thank you everybody who's listening today. I'm happy um, that you're here and that I get to share some of my work with you. I was told that this should be more of a fun talk and less of a traditional science talk, not that science isn't fun. Um, so if you have your heart set on graphs and figures, um, my apologies in advance. Um, what I would like to do is take you to a few of my field sites um, on a few of the projects that I've had the opportunity to work on since I started at the Institute for Conservation Medicine. And as Sasha mentioned, um, before I get to where I am now, um, I always want to give some perspective on where I started because it really informs the work that I do. Um, so I did start my career in human health and um, specifically public health and working in HIV AIDS prevention. And the ways that that has informed what I do now um, is really giving me a population health perspective. So um, I practice medicine, but I have a population viewpoint. Um, and working particularly on HIV AIDS um, really highlighted um, the power of an emerging infectious disease in a population, even on a global scale. I think we can all relate to that right now. Um, and also the fact that problems, even when they're global problems, need local solutions. So that's something we'll come back to a little bit later when we talk about um, capacity building. So I was working at UCSF um, doing this work that I found very meaningful um, and may have even stayed there, except at the same time, I was volunteering at a wildlife rehabilitation center. So this is little baby pre-veterinarian Maris. Um, I, they gave me scrubs. I hadn't quite earned them yet. Um, but I was, I was working like crazy at UCSF, and um, at the same time, I was finding whatever free time I could to go in and work on this ring-billed gull that was hit by a car, or wake up at 4 a.m. to feed this western gray squirrel. Um, and I just got a certain type of joy out of this sort of hands-on work with wildlife and uh, treating individuals um, that I didn't get out of my other work, which I found really meaningful and gratifying. And so eventually I encountered the concept of One Health. Um, and this is something Sasha also alluded to. So um, One Health, or um, you'll hear the term conservation medicine, we are um, at the Institute for Conservation Medicine. That's, that's the term that we use more frequently. Um, it's really um, just the fundamental concept that the health of humans, non-human animals, and the environments that we inhabit are all interconnected. It's actually pretty intuitive when you say it, um, but it calls us to take a holistic multidisciplinary approach to any one of these problems. And so when I encountered this as a growing discipline, 
I realized that there was a way for me to pull together um, my public health and human health background, my global development background, um, and this joy and love I had working with wildlife um, into sort of a cohesive career. Um, so as Sasha said, I decided to go to vet school, stayed on and got my master's. Um, and that really brings me to where I am today. Um, so I am just under two years into a three-year fellowship with the St. Louis Zoo's Institute for Conservation Medicine. And my official title is research fellow, but um, really um, research is one component of what I do and it's a very important component of what I do. Um, but I also do a lot of other things that fall under that conservation medicine umbrella. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about um, projects in three areas. Um, the first is working with African vultures to address the issue of poisoning with pesticides. Um, the next is working with radiated tortoises in Madagascar um, to make sure that they are healthy before they're released back into the wild. And um, the last is capacity building. Um, that's, it's a big part of my work and we'll um, come back to that a little bit later. So we'll start in South Africa um, working on the vulture poisoning project. Um, this is a tagged cape vulture eating at what's called a vulture restaurant. So uh, vulture restaurants are places where people put out food that they know is safe. So it is not laced with poisons. It doesn't have any veterinary drug residues um, and um, it's available. So in situations where carcasses are cleared frequently from the landscape, this is a great way um, for vultures to have safe and healthy food. Um, so when we think about African vultures, so these are all the old world vulture, a lot of the old world vulture species, seven out of 11 of them are IUCN listed as either endangered or critically endangered. And their primary threats, habitat losses is, is always gonna be on that list. Um, but two that are pretty unique to vultures are poisoning and power lines. And the one that I am focusing on here is poisoning. So Vultures don't um, don't uh, typically be the victims of intentional poisoning. So usually what's happening is you have a livestock predator conflict and farmers will lace a carcass, so a cow or a sheep, with pesticides that are available over the counter. And the intention there is to get the predator. But the vultures find the carcass because it's a carcass and it smells good and tasty to a vulture, just like all of these vultures here eating their old pig and impala parts. And um, they end up dying en masse. Um, you also see this at poaching sites. So um, poachers will lace an elephant carcass, let's say, with poison so that the vultures don't draw att uh, attention to the carcass. Because of in-country lab capacity, there's very little uh, ability to actually identify this poisoning when it happens. So one of the big needs in addressing this is a rapid means of identifying poisoned vultures when and where they occur. And this is as, as technical as I'm probably gonna get today, but um, so the pesticides that are most commonly used for this sort of poisoning um, affect an enzyme called cholinesterase. And in humans, we test cholinesterase to monitor occupational exposure and also to monitor exposure in the military because these pesticides can actually be used as uh, chemical weapons. So this um, beautiful uh, black and white photo of this little analyzer um, is actually a portable analyzer designed for military use um, that tests cholinesterase levels. Our question was, can we use this portable field analyzer to actually detect cholinesterase uh, toxicity in vultures, specifically African white-backed vultures and cape vultures? You can see that African white-back is showing you his little, his little white-back there in that picture. 
to answer this question, I traveled to Volpro. And Volpro is a rescue and rehabilitation center in South Africa. In addition to rescuing and releasing animals, they have about 250 non-releasable vultures that they maintain on property for conservation breeding and for research. So this is a picture of one of their um, African whiteback vultures. So the same vulture you saw in the previous picture. And these are its two fledglings. So these are two fledglings that I got to see when I was there just this past January that uh, by now have actually been released back into the wild. Um, so Volpero has a lot of things and a lot of capacity, but one thing they don't have is a veterinarian. So once a year, uh, Dr. Sarah Woodhouse of the Detroit Zoo has been going there to do annual exams on all of these vultures. And I went with her this past year so that we could do those exams, but also pilot test that cholinesterase analyzer. I want to just give you a, a quick snapshot of what one of these enclosures looks like with uh, the cape vultures in it. So there are actually about 50 birds in this enclosure. Cape vultures are cliff nesters, so these are a whole bunch of different cliff nesting sites. You can see they had sort of staked out territory up there. Um, and the team is just sort of sitting around strategizing how we are actually going to catch these vultures in this enclosure um, to see um, if they're healthy and do all of the research that we need to do on them. So we went through a few different enclosures like that. We started out first day, we were excited. Um, and we're thinking, okay, we can get, we, ha we have eight working days. We can do physical exams and blood work on all 200 and some odd vultures that are there. Um, so we have to catch up the vultures. Everybody gets a complete physical. So this is uh, Dr. Woodhouse looking in the eye of a fledgling white back vulture. Um, everybody got complete blood work. So just like when you go to the doctor and they do screening blood work. Um, so that's like your white blood cell count, your red blood cell count and your baseline chemistry. We drew blood from the vultures and did all of that work on them there in the field. And then this was, this was Sarah and I at the end of our first field morning, looking relatively fresh and optimistic. There's a little bit of bird poop, a little bit of feathers, but we're still, we're looking pretty good. We're feeling pretty excited about it. So then we, we transitioned into the lab um, and um, had, a, had a host of samples to process. So the first day we looked at 26 birds. So out of all of those, we need to do chromosomal sexing on all of them because they're not sexually dimorphic. So that's what those dried blood spots are on filter paper. We'll take that back and figure out if they're male or female. Then we make blood smears on all of them, which is what you're seeing in the second picture um, and look at those under the microscope to again, look at red blood cells, white blood cells, anemia, immune function, um, and then um, also hemoparasites. So we got, we got a lot of help. This, um, there was a moth on my scope pretty much every night, sometimes between the lens and the slide, usually just kind of hanging out, keeping me company, which was lovely. Um, our lab was in the vulture ICU, which is a converted horse stall. So it was, it was open to the air. Um, and we did find some interesting things. So in this last picture, if you're not used to looking at avian red blood cells, um, they look different than mammals. So they all have nucleuses. Um, and just you're just looking for the one that's different than the other ones. So that pink one um, has a hemoparasite in it. So it's got a blood parasite. So that's one of the interesting things that we found that we're still trying to investigate a little bit more. But at the end of that day, it was about 4 a.m. And we had just finished processing all of that blood. So we, we did it, we got that cholinesterase, everything else, but we don't, we don't look great, we don't look too sane. Um, so we decided to adjust our expectations a little bit and realized maybe we weren't gonna be able to do all 250 vultures while we were there. Um, we also realized that instead of me being able to show you lots of amazing vulture pictures, I was gonna be behind the scope every second that I was awake. Uh, we were there so long that the Volpro staff started calling us the lab humans and eventually put an interpretive sign on our little cage so people would know what we were. 
So in the end, we were um, able to assess um, 153 of the vultures. Um, so that was their entire collection of cape and whiteback vultures. That doesn't include this lappet faced vulture. He's just here because he's beautiful and I wanted to share him with you. All of this took this extraordinary team full of vulture wranglers and vulture caretakers. This is at its heart, Volpro's project. And so um, I just wanna really acknowledge them for all of the work they do and all of the vulture rehabilitation, rescue and research that they do. And at the end of the day then, or at the end of the eight days, um, what we learned about our colonesterase analyzer, well, this was a pilot. So what we learned is that it was really practical and easy to use in the field. You can hook it up to a car battery if you need to, you can hook it up to a solar cell. Um, and it had high precision, meaning if you use it, you can use it again and again and again on the same sample and you get the same result. What we don't know yet is do those results mean anything clinically for this animal? Um, so are they accurate and are they relevant? And so our next step is gonna be to look at it in vultures that we suspect to have been exposed to poison um, and to validate it against a more standard of care cholinesterase analyzer at a big lab. Right, so I traveled directly from uh, South Africa to Madagascar. So we've moved from January of 2020 to February of 2020 now, um, and um, joined a project with the Turtle Survival Alliance, um, working on reintroducing radiated tortoises. The radiated tortoises are endemic to the Southern part of Madagascar. Um, they are critically endangered primarily because their rate of population decline is so dramatic right now. Um, and again, primary threat is habitat loss. But in this case, uh, the other primary threat is illegal collection. And um, they are collected for food, but even more so they are collected for the pet trade. Um, so in the past decade, the scale of collection for the pet trade has um, really skyrocketed. And what that means is what you're looking at in this picture. So these tortoises are from a confiscation that happened in 2018, where over 8,000 tortoises were found in one location. And all of those tortoises were destined to be shipped um, typically to China, then on to other locations. Um, another confiscation of 10,000 tortoises followed shortly after. So um, as I mentioned, the Turtle Survival Alliance, which is uh, the TSA, so not the TSA you're used to, um, but they are responsible for caring for all of these confiscated tortoises. Um, they have upwards of 24,000 radiated tortoises in their care right now. So at a time when we have wild populations dramatically declining and extirpated in some places, and we have 25,000 almost in captivity, creating a confiscation to release pathway is really a key part of conservation for this species. And PSA is getting ready to actually release a thousand tortoises. So it's a really large scale release and they've done the really hard on the ground work of building relationships with communities, um, to try and create safe places to release these tortoises in. So I can't show you um, their conservation center in Southern Madagascar because of a lot of different security reasons. Um, but this is the main pathway. And this honestly is what the tortoise conservation center looks like. It is native spiny forest. Um, so it's a dry uh, desert-like habitat. Um, it's totally unique to Madagascar. And it's really important that it's native habitat because that's the perfect place to rear tortoises for reintroduction. So my role there was um, two, po two parts. Um, so the first was to do pre-release health assessments. Um, and the second was to establish baseline health parameters for this population. So pre-release health assessments, um, really what I'm doing when I do that is I pick up a tortoise that is gonna go out into the wild and 
I ask two questions. I say, is this tortoise healthy enough to succeed after release? We want it to be a good weight. We want it um, to be a good candidate. There are 25,000 of them. Let's make sure we're putting the ones that have the best chance out into the wild. The other thing, which is really important and gets back to a lot of the emerging infectious disease things that I mentioned early on, is does this tortoise potentially carry pathogens that are gonna put wild tortoises at risk? So we don't know the history of these tortoises. Um, we know that they didn't leave Madagascar, but we don't know if they came into contact with animals from other parts of the country, um, other species. Um, so they can be carrying pathogens, essentially invasive pathogens with them that we could be reintroducing, kind of like a zebra mussel on a boat, right? And then when we talk about baseline health parameters, um, this is similar to what we did for the vultures. So um, we want to know where we start to understand where we're going. So this is this is a this is a radiated tortoise just starting. This was not um, one of our study subjects. Um, he was far, far too young. Um, but um, for many wild species, really foundational knowledge is missing from a veterinary perspective. So we don't actually know what the white blood cell count should be in a radiated tortoise. We don't necessarily know what it should be for the specific population that's actually living in its native habitat, eating a natural diet. Um, and when we know those things, we can um, both assess whether or not that animal is healthy and we can monitor the success of their release. So again, it takes a village. Um, so many people actually put work into this and it was very much a collaborative effort and it was very much a collaborative uh, Malagasy and US effort. Um, TSA has an incredible Madagascar program with uh, Niaina, who is a Malagasy vet, Tony, who is another vet student who was with us, um, and then keeper and uh, management staff. Um, the Wildlife Conservation Society in Bronx Zoo also sent several people. So um, <laughs> down in what is the right-hand corner for me is Bonnie Raphael, who is um, a legend in the tortoise health world. If I bet you didn't know there was such a thing, but it's true. And next to her um, is Paul Callie, who I had to Photoshop in because he showed up late. So he missed the picture. Um, and then um, we also have Dahlia Ferguson, who was a technician that they sent. Um, who did an incredible job with our team. Um, and last in the far back is Jane Merkel, who is our own uh, zoological manager in the Department of Animal Health here at the St. Louis Zoo. So many hands made this happen, which I'm happy about because I could not have examined a thousand tortoises by myself again in eight days. So you might be curious how one goes about examining a tortoise. And this is primarily about patients. So these guys, and one thing to notice is these tortoises are pretty small. Um, that's on purpose. So the age range that we're targeting for release are sub-adults because they're a little big to be desirable for the pet trade. And they're a little bit small uh, to be desirable for meat. So they're sort of in this sweet spot. And so we always look in their mouth because they actually get herpes and they get little cold sore like things just like we do. So we wanna see um, that the inside of their mouth is healthy. We're looking everywhere we can possibly find in this little tortoise, which is not a lot of places when it comes down to it, right? Like there's a lot of shell on that tortoise, but if you feel right in before that thigh on both sides, you can feel eggs. So we can tell, um, whether or not this animal has eggs right now. And the other thing you can feel are bladder stones, which we didn't feel in these guys, but that's a big problem in Californian desert tortoises. And you can see we've got kind of two teams going at the same time. It's pretty simple. It's weight, it's physical exam, open the mouth. And then we mark the little tortoise who you can see his, his legs are just jamming. He's like, please just let me out of here. And away they go. And that is how you manage to do pre-release health assessments on a thousand tortoises. Whoop. So 
Then there were the lucky few. Um, these were the ones who participated in advanced health screening and the research component of this. So these are the ones that we use to establish those baseline health parameters I was talking about. So um, we collected a suite of diagnostic samples on these guys. So um, we drew blood. There's a space um, right up over the head um, at the base of, or like the front part of the shell in turtles and tortoises where you can collect blood from. Um, that's a pretty common site. So we got blood from all of these guys. Um, we took swabs. So again, I was mentioning how important it is to look in a turtle's mouth or a tortoise's mouth. So we swab the mouth and actually look for infectious agents by PCR. And we also swab the cloaca. So we swab the other end to look for pathogens there as well. So that's part of how we're answering this question of whether or not they're carrying diseases that we need to be worried about for wild animals. Um, and we do full morphometrics on these guys as well to get a really uh, quantitative sense of uh, whether or not their appropriate weight, uh, size, body condition for their stage of development. And because we had this big team, um, we actually made really great time. And so I had permits in place to be able to work on wild tortoises as well. Um, and I didn't think I was going to be able to get to, but we did make great time. So we left and went outside the gates of the TCC. And like I said, it's beautiful spiny forest right outside the gates. So there are actually radiated tortoises walking the paths everywhere. Um, it's, it's mind blowing when you're in this situation where um, you have an animal that you know is endangered that you know used to be really common and used to sort of exist in the landscape at this density because there really are, there really are a lot of them. Um, and so we did uh, everything that I did with the confiscated tortoises, I did with these wild tortoises. So we took blood, we took swabs for infectious disease, um, I did a full physical exam. Um, and, you know, one of the really big differences um, that I saw, and you can see this in the right hand picture, is that these tortoises have a lot of trauma. So that's what a broken shell looks like, but that's also what a broken healing shell looks like. So this animal was either stepped on by a cow, was run over by a cart, something like that. And it's healed on its own, which um, is something we see in tons of turtle and tortoise species, um, is this really remarkable capacity to heal from really traumatic injuries, um, which is one thing at least that bodes really well for their success. Um, So we took all of those samples and we brought them back to the lab. So you heard the routine when we were working with the vultures. Um, this first picture is our chemistry analyzer. I don't know if I mentioned this, but it was very, very, very hot where we were. Um, and it was so hot that our chemistry analyzer stopped working. So we created a little, a little swamp cooler for it and we have ice packs and a fan and in fact, Dahlia is looking at it because that's her fan that she brought to cool herself with that you can't use because it's sitting there keeping our chemistry analyzer cool. Um, so we ran chemistry on all of these guys. We um, did the same slide work, white blood cell count, red blood cell count. Um, this is Jane, our technician, um, working with Tony, the vet student, teaching him actually how to read slides because it's something he hasn't had the opportunity to do before. And then anything that we couldn't process in the field went into um, our faithful liquid nitrogen tank. Um, just to give you a concept of how big this thing was, um, that's it in the backseat of a car. Um, we needed a lot of liquid nitrogen to keep stuff frozen for that long. We ended up naming this uh, R2D2 because we thought it looked like R2D2. And then just when you were exhausted, pretty much every day at about 6 p.m., a troop of ring-tailed lemurs would come by the lab. This, this lemur is actually looking through the window. So I, if you can imagine me, I'm standing there and I'm uh, washing my hands off after the physical exams, I'm covered in dirt and sweat. And I just look up and this guy is looking right at me. Um, and this is one of those things where uh, you just, you have this moment that, completely washes away all your exhaustion and makes you remember just how lucky you are to be where you are. 
So what have we learned about these little guys? Um, so altogether, we examined about 1,200 tortoises. And out of those, only about 50 were deemed unfit for release. And the main reasons that they were unfit were either their shell was soft. Um, this is something I didn't highlight in the video, but I kind of give a squeeze at the end. And right along the seams, just like a baby has a fontanelle that closes and it can have a little soft spot, these guys have soft spots on the seams of their shells. And you want those to firm up because otherwise um, their skeleton isn't developing correctly. So that was, that was the main reason that we rejected animals for release. And what that tells me is that there are probably some nutritional issues for these guys. So even though they have access to all this native vegetation, there are so many of them that it's supplemented pretty heavily with things like cactus pads and watermelon. Um, and they are probably um, have a calorie to calcium imbalance. Um, the other thing we learned is that among all of the things that global pandemics are bad for, they're also bad for research because the rest of our samples um, have yet to be analyzed. Um, some are sitting in Madagascar and some are actually made it to the Bronx Zoo um, where the PCR will take place, um, but nobody's been able to go into the zoo to run those yet. So stay tuned. So this last chapter is um, not a research project, but is a huge part of the work that I do, which is capacity building. Um, and I wanted to uh, talk about it because um, I, because I think it's really important. And I think if the sort of work that I do is going to be done in a sustainable and ethical and effective way, the best thing I can do is train myself out of a job. It doesn't make any sense to keep spending the money and the carbon um, to send an American veterinarian to Madagascar when in this case, in this picture, there are Malagasy students and professionals who are more than capable of doing that work and doing it better than I can. Um, they just need to be uh, given the resources and the support and the opportunity. So, I'm starting out with sort of the medical background of this, but this really in many ways was a capacity building trip. So I um, worked, this is now last May, May of 2019 um, with Mahalina, which is um, a laboratory um, run by Dr. Fidi Rasamba Narivu. That's not exactly how you say his last name, but that's definitely how it's spelled. Um, and we took tons of or three students from his lab to Park Ivaluin. Um, Park Ivaluin is a captive lemur facility um, that is run by the Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group. Um, the way they got in sort of the captive lemur world was because people would come to them um, as a group researching lemurs and doing conservation work um, when they had lemurs that had been taken into human custody, but no longer had a home. So they sort of ended up creating an educational opportunity out of that and a conservation breeding opportunity, and now run this captive facility, Park Evaluin. Um, the Madagascar Flora and Fauna Group is supported in large part by the St. Louis Zoo Wild Care Institute. Um, and so we have that connection with them and um, there had been some ongoing health issues with two out of their three highest priority species, which is the blue-eyed black and the black and white ruffed lemurs. And so um, I was traveling there already to look at some of those health issues, do sort of a disease risk analysis for them. Um, and I partnered with uh, Mahalina to also turn that into a training opportunity. This is a really unique place. It's a really unique and beautiful place, actually. Um, and we started with um, a basic disease risk assessment. So that meant understanding everything about these animals' lives and where you have the possibility for pathogens to enter. So this is these are the students and I talking to Bernard, who is um, basically the manager of Park Evaluine. Um, and we got a full history, drew out maps of the property, um, and mapped out all the health problems they've had on that layout. Um, and two of the big 
risk points that we saw were this water pump. This water pump um, is a great tool for them to have, but it is the source of all of the drinking water and the water that they clean their fruits and vegetables with. Um, and it pulls water directly out of a lake. Um, and there are free ranging lemurs going to the bathroom in that lake all the time. Um, and one thing we noticed is that the filtration system on this pump hasn't been replaced in years and years and years. So that was that was one highlight that we we sort of thought about. Um, and then the other, which is really unique to Evaluane, is the fact that these captive lemurs have really regular interaction with free ranging lemurs. So you can see in this right hand picture, that's a black and white roughed lemur interacting hand to hand, nose to nose, bum to bum with another free ranging uh, black and white rough lemur. So a lot of opportunities for pathogen transfer. Um, so we took all of the high priority species and went ahead and did um, full annual exams on them. And for lemurs, that means anesthesia. And I have this um, time lapse video of us working on one of the black and white roughed lemurs. Oh, just kidding. It's um, actually a blue eyed black. And even though it's a blue eyed black, she's red because she's female. And so you can see, um, I would always have one of the three students paired up with me to work on the physical exam um, and all of the sample taking. And one of them would be working on lab processing. And then a third student is actually out of the room recovering animals from anesthesia. And in, these, in lemurs, you actually draw blood down, down by the hip like that. Um, and we're gonna take swabs, we're gonna take all of the samples, um, really similar samples to what we took um, for the vultures and the radiated tortoises. Um, but I get to do a much more thorough physical exam on this lemur, both because it's not awake and because it doesn't have a shell. Two bonuses from a veterinary perspective. And really, we mostly found um, these lemurs to be very apparently healthy, like in really good condition. Their coats are in excellent condition, their tail, you, know, you wanna check the whole tail, that was an excellent condition. Um, so we're sort of thinking more about those environmental risk factors and thinking about point source uh, infections. And getting back to the capacity building piece, um, so to me, in many ways, the most valuable part of this experience was training these students. They have all completed their clinical training. Um, that means that uh, this is Tatiana. Um, she's put together a blood smear here. This is Rutsu. She's uh, reading um, blood for anemia. And then Santaj on the right um, is monitoring this animal under anesthesia. Um, these, despite the fact that they've completely finished their clinical training, none of them had ever done these things before. Um, so being able to feel comfortable and competent, um, running anesthesia, collecting baseline blood work and running those samples is, is uh, a huge piece of knowledge transfer. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up um, with sort of a quick story. Um, the setting for this story is, um, this is another capacity building, but that's not really the reason I'm telling the story. So this was the One Health Horn Summer School. And what this was is there is um, a group called the One Health uh, Network for the Horn of Africa, which is Kenya, Ethiopia, Somaliland. Um, and this network brought together um, over 16 early career scientists from those countries for a six day field camp. And so I was lucky enough to be one of the instructors for that field camp. These were um, human doctors, these were veterinarians, ecologists, um, microbiologists, so a really diverse multidisciplinary team. Um, and we spent those six days at the Impala Research Station on camping on the river, and each day they learned a different subject. So. Um, there was vector biology, there was climatology, um, we did epidemiology and anthropology. And then I was in charge of the Wildlife Health Day. 
So the activities we went through on Wildlife Health Day were um, a road transect, which is a great way to sample large mammals in that environment, and the super fun dung survey. Um, these guys were great troopers because they got out in the hot sun at noon and uh, counted dung with me for several hours. As we were finishing up our day, you can see we're finally rolling up that last, uh, that last measuring tape for the last transect. Um, we looked up and realized that there were elephants nearby. And they're pretty far away at this point. You can't really tell in this picture, but you know, everybody just kind of stopped what they were doing um, and looked up for a minute. It turned out, you know, we were right next to a watering hole because we wanted to know what how the density of animals was different at the watering hole versus a foraging site. And the elephant family walked right up to the watering hole, sat there, took a drink rolled around in the mud for a little while, little babies um, getting in there, getting the flies off. And eventually went on their way. And this group, we watched them for at least 30 minutes. Um, and the reason I bring up this story um, is because I was next to a woman named Marie at one point. Um, and this is her. And she is a microbiologist. She studies pathogens in milk. She is a Kenyan. And she has never seen an elephant before. And she was standing next to me and just turned to me and was genuinely had tears in her eyes and just said, I thank God for the privilege of seeing these animals here today. And again, I'm the American veterinarian who has walked into this world. Like this is my absolute privilege. And I had an opportunity to introduce her to her own wildlife and to motivate her to interact with them and protect them and give her some tools to study them. Um, and that's actually her holding a piece of elephant dung at the end because we hadn't finished our dung surveys yet. So um, I do just want to acknowledge um, the many funders and collaborators that I had on all of these projects. Um, you are all here. I am not going to go through you one by one, but thank you. Um, and then I think we can open it up for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Maris. Everybody's clapping out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so for all of you watching, there are many of you, please put some of your questions in the chat on the YouTube channel and I will convey them to Maris and she can answer them for you. So bring them on. I actually had a question, Maris. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so being an ecologist, I guess I'm curious, um, how much communication or even or collaboration or even just communication is there between the people that are studying these captive animals and doing more of this kind of um, individual health assessment work and, con and you know on the ground conservation work how much do those does that group of people interact with researchers that are doing more population level work um maybe you know, from an academic institution or something like that. And is there much interaction? Is it the same people? And mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that's my question. Yeah, and I um, I think it's an excellent question. And um, I'm also probably not the best person to answer it um, because I do fit my niche pretty well. Um, but I will say that um, I think the answer to that is gonna be highly variable. So TSA um, has, you know, they're made up of conservation biologists and, and turtle biologists mostly. Um, and then um, they have a number of um, ecologists that mostly they've gotten to work on things through uh, funded PhD opportunities. Um, so they, they're very much though on top of um, 
the wild populations and population dynamics. Um, but I, I can't speak very intelligently about it. Um, I would say one of the reasons I really liked working with Volpro also is that um, they do something that most rehabilitation organizations do not do, which is they, um, they track their animals after they release them. So the fledglings um, in particular get GPS tags. Um, everybody gets rings, but they, they try to track movement of animals and Carrie Walter, the director of that organization has a project, um, her, her background is actually in ecology um, and she also tags wild vultures and does comparisons to help, <coughs> excuse me, help her understand how these animals she's raising may or may not use the landscape or be successful in a way that is different from how the wild born populations do. Did that answer your question? Yes, very much so. Thank you. And, and also you said just a lot isn't even known about a lot of these animals in the wild or in captivity, right? Yes. I, for vultures, that is particularly true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of really foundational information um, is not known about a lot of uh, African vulture species. Maris, I had a question. You, you brought up um, some of the conservation breeding prospects uh, for the vultures. And I, I would be interested to hear you talk more about sort of the program they have, kind of what the long-term goals are and what some of the introduction, what some of the challenges might be with sort of introducing, uh, reintroducing some of these captive bred vultures. Sure. Um, so yeah, so Volpro um, has a breeding program for lappet faced vultures, African whiteback, and um, cape. So the two I worked with were the cape and the African whiteback, and then the lappet face is the one that you saw the pretty picture of. Um, so um, their goal, so this is where this, at this point their goal really is to find a way to make non-releasable vultures productive. And so sort of the hypothesis is that breeding new vultures and introducing to them into the wild um, will help reverse declines. Um, will it or won't it, I think is an open question, which is where like a lot of that GPS tracking data comes from and their mortality data. Um, some big challenges that they run into, um, the two biggest ones I would say are um, habituation. So vultures are actually way friendlier than you would expect. Um, and so uh, keeping a captive reared vulture from uh, habituating to human contact is, is a little bit challenging and humans are, are a big threat for vultures. Um, and then the other one is the same problem you have with any reintroduction program, which is that the threats that the wild population is facing, um, if you're not mitigating those, it doesn't matter how many animals you release. Um, they're going to fall prey to the same thing. So that's going to be poison. That's going to be power strikes um, or power line strikes. Um, and so Velpro actually has a really excellent um, program looking at power line strike mitigation where they tag power lines to make them more visible for vultures so that they don't run into them. Um, because in their little micro region, that's actually the number one cause of death and injury. In terms of, um, so in terms of like the captive rearing of the nestlings, how, how are they go about doing it? Are they letting the parents of the vultures stay with the nestlings or are they hand feeding or, or what's the, I guess I'm going to that. Yes, so they typically pull them, <clears throat> excuse me, they'll pull the egg at the end of brooding and replace it with a fake egg. And they'll basically get it through hatch um, because they had some of their parents um, sort of like crushing the egg or suffocating the egg during the hatching process. So they'll get it through hatch and hand feed it for about the first day and then put it back in the nest. Um, and that's successful, it seems like maybe like 85 to 90% of the time. And every now and then they have one where the parents won't take it back or potentially we're never gonna care well for it. Um, because they're all in an open enclosure and they, they do free breeding, you can't really control which pairs breeds. You can't say, you guys are bad parents, please don't make an egg next year. Um, so they have some repeat offenders in that department, um, but um, they do try to definitely have vultures raise vultures and not people raise vultures. Really interesting, thanks. Hey Maris, we have a question here from Jamie Palmer and she says, asks, has the One Health workshop in Kenya allowed for improved information sharing in the time since the workshop between Kenyan participants? Okay, 
Sure. Um, yeah, so the workshop, but even more so the network itself. So that network supports, so these, these um, scientists are fellows for a two year period of time um, and they have their own Slack channels and they are like constantly connected from what I can tell. So I get WhatsApp messages from them all the time still. Um, and a piece of that was putting together projects um, amongst the amongst the fellows. So you would take um, three of those students and they would have to work on an actual research project together. Um, and so that's that's created some pretty strong long-term collaboration. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's really great about it is that it's really, um, they share a lot of career and training opportunities. Um, so there's a lot of going to each other for information, but also a lot of um, sharing of opportunities that I think would be hard to access if they didn't have those information channels. Great. Maris, how would you sort of compare some of the major challenges of working on vultures versus tortoises? They seem like they're obviously quite different. Um, but I guess I was curious, sort of your perspective on, you know, you go down there and you do all of this in a month and that's amazing. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit more about sort of your, the challenges that you personally face. Sure. Um, so, so I have to say tortoises, tortoises are really easy to work with if you're patient, but they don't give you a lot right off the bat, right? So, um, I don't have to, you know, the, I don't have to chase a tortoise, um, just the logistics of it. It's not mostly not going to bite me every now and then they do. Um, it will take that like big fat leg and trap my finger inside its shell and crush it if it wants to, which is, which is a fun thing, but mostly they're pretty mellow. Um, and they recover really quickly too. Like you saw, you put that one down, he just goes back and I can promise you that tortoise was eating in like three seconds after I put it down. Um, the vultures, um, you know, vultures are dangerous. They're really, really big birds. Um, they're not aggressive, but when you um, have to handle them, they become very aggressive for, for good reason. Um, and then I think um, the other piece of that is um, the population of vultures that I was working with. Um, it, they're, all they're all rehabilitation animals that were non-releasable. So that means that they either had a wing amputation, they, they have something wrong with them that makes them not function in the wild. So they're a baseline um, challenged population physiologically. Um, whereas the tortoises, um, the whole goal there was to find really healthy animals that um, ideally will do well in the wild and are, are most of the way to being wild tortoises already. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Maris, I'm curious, um, just something that really comes out from your show or from your presentation is uh, the many issues that arise that somehow I feel like doesn't happen if you're doing research here in your own country, um, mainly because of the, so my example is, is the, I mean, I guess this is, this happens for folks whenever they do field work, but it seems like an extreme case when you have to tote all of your equipment through the airport, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean and um, curious kind of how much of a barrier do you think for this sort of work, to, um, how much of a barrier is just pure bureaucratic um, uh, moving of equipment, being able to get permission to do things in certain places and sort of coming up with these shared agreements between researchers from different countries? How much of that sort of limits the sort of conservation work? Yeah. So. I'm, a, I'm of two minds in my answer to that question. And so uh, one mind is it is, a, it is a massive barrier. And I would say um, one of the biggest ones that, that the type of research I do faces is um, actually CITES permitting. So we, um, we don't move whole animals, right? Um, but we, and we don't move them for trade, which is what CITES is meant to regulate. It's meant to regulate the, trade of uh, endangered species primarily. Um, but we need CITES permits to move blood. I need a CITES permit to 
um, I have toenail clippings from these radiated tortoises to do isotope analysis and we need a CITES permit for that. Um, and the intention behind that is, is good, um, but that actually is a huge barrier for most scientists doing international research on regulated species is it can take you a year, two years to get your samples out of a country. Um, in order to be able to analyze them um, because you're sort of following, falling under a regulatory framework that wasn't designed for science. It was designed for trade. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and just the sheer logistics of it is, you know, I, I, I never, almost never make it through customs ever um, without getting stopped. And I usually have to open the liquid nitrogen tank and it's leaving gas out into the environment and it looks like a bomb. It's it's a mess and uh, yeah, so it's challenging. But having said that, I also think, um, I think forming agreements with uh, local organizations, like I, I don't think I should be doing this work if I'm not doing that. Um, so I'm more than happy to jump through 18 MOU hoops because I think, um, you know, I think if radiated tortoises belong to anyone, they belong to Madagascar, they don't belong to me. Right. So, yeah. And it really bodes well, I mean, which makes something like the Mahaliana organization so amazing because they're building capacity to actually process the samples and have. Yeah, and actually, so, so we have these samples stuck in Madagascar um, and we have some at the Bronx Zoo. And um, uh, one of the, one of the grants we've written recently um, that uh, Kathleen, our lab manager actually is the PI on is to go to Mahalina and get them up and running on these tortoise PCRs um, so that the samples can stay in country and this is a non-issue in the future. Um, and that sort of has that dual benefit of, um, we don't have to deal with exporting. We can actually screen animals in real time um, and um, that's a huge capacity building endeavor because TSA is gonna pay Mahalina forever now to do their PCR if everything goes well. So we have one last question coming in from Maya Dubno and they wanna know, how do you maintain a sterile field uh, during procedures that are in the actual fields? So is it is it difficult uh, when you're not in an isolated hospital environment? I imagine yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited yeah. to hear you. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so fortunately, um, so on these projects, we're we're using aseptic technique. We're not, we don't need a sterile field. So you need a sterile field when you're doing surgery or when you're cutting something open. Um, having said that, I have done that in the field, and it is um it is difficult, but it's not impossible. So um any surface on some level can be a surgery table, especially if you have a clean tarp. Um, and you just do it how you would normally do it. You drape them with a surgical drape or you drape them with the outside of your glove wrapper because that's sterile. You find something sterile that you can drape um, an animal or an injury with. So one of the things that I have done is put uh, intracelomic transmitters in canvas back ducts. So that's actually how you monitor a lot of water ducts is um, you actually have to put the transmitters inside them because they need to maintain their ability to swim properly and you can't mess up their waterproofing. So, um, so that's abdominal surgery basically. And that's exactly how we do it is we take, um, we take drapes with us into the field. You can even take like for something like that, like a little metal table into the field. Um, and it's usually a good idea to cover animals with antibiotics because the reality is um, there's wind, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's all sorts of things that um, you can't control that um, can bring contamination into that surgical site. Anything else? Actually, I do. There's one more ah. question from the chat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, got some people talking now. So this is um, Leah Owen to ask, Thanks for your talk. My question is, what are you going to do after your fellowship ends? Oh my this gosh, is a good, can I turn this is this a off? great closing question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I, you know, I uh, would love to know the answer to that question also. That's probably how I'm going to answer it. Um, I, I'll be looking for work in 2021. 
Um, I, I love the work that I do right now. Um, and I, I hope to find a way ideally to stay in um, sort of a nonprofit or NGO setting. Um, I am, I, I love doing applied conservation work and I love having research be a component of that, but I like doing really applied research. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's to be determined. Um, but I have to say that um, this is very much a new field and my whole career path until now has been to be determined and the fellowship I'm in, I'm the first person to do it. Um, it didn't exist before me and um, hopefully it will exist after me. So um, I'm, I think if you are somebody who is interested in doing conservation medicine work or One Health work, um, part of your path is, is creating your path. So check in with me again in a, in a year, year and a half. <laughs> great, thanks everybody for all of your great questions. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up, Maris. Thank you so much for a really good presentation. It was so interesting. And um, we'll join everybody one month from today for our last um, Adventures in Biodiversity Research series. So thank you all for uh, joining us and this will be available online later as well. So bye Maris, thanks thank so much. You.